Welcome to Russian History Retold, episode 219, an interview with Lucy Ward, the author of The Empress and the English Doctor, How Catherine the Great Defied a Deadly Virus. Welcome to our show, Lucy. Thank you very much for inviting me. So we're going to get right into the book, which I, I absolutely adored. Uh, I've already posted on Facebook that I told my listeners that I would read finished reading it while on vacation in Costa Rica, sitting on the beach, and I just didn't want to leave, even though I was getting bit up by uh, lots of mosquitoes. And uh, it, was, it was just an amazing book, and it's coming out shortly uh, in June here in the U.S., and it's already available, I understand, in the U.K. Uh, we'll start with our first question. Uh, since Catherine the Great <clears throat> made a bold decision to get inoculated against smallpox, What do you see as the role of political leaders in public health crises, something that we've had to deal with in the United States as well as you have in the UK? That's right, we we have. In fact, we have the world over. And it's interesting, of course, I thought about this a lot because I was actually researching and writing this book during a period of lockdown and then um, during the whole COVID period in Britain. I pitched the book just before the virus. Uh, became known but I was writing absolutely throughout Um, and so I was literally writing against the background of for example in the UK our own Prime Minister um, contracting Covid becoming very ill actually going into intensive care in hospital and then of course uh, recovering from that so those parallels were really sharp to me I think that the, the, the way that Catherine the great projected her inoculation against smallpox after she'd recovered from it was to say that she had set an example for her people. And she literally, she she projected that so strongly that she even had um, kind of medals uh, struck, which said um, she herself set an example with a, an image of herself and her son, who she also had inoculated against smallpox by the English doctor, Thomas Dinsdale. So her whole message around what she was doing was I did this I took this risk a risk that I very much thought was worth taking especially when compared with the absolute horror of of smallpox itself and you should follow me I've I've kind of trodden this path first myself and then I've also um, done the same thing I've I've tested this technology if you like on my own child and heir in her case um, and therefore it's safe for you to follow. And I think that that's really the key. And as I see it, it's the way that, that uh, national leaders need to behave in a public health crisis. You know, this is all about trust and we need to believe that you're not telling, they're not telling us to do anything that they wouldn't do themselves. And I think this is particularly the case with uh, leadership around vaccination because Obviously, vaccination is it's not a, uh, a, a treatment, if you like. This is a preventative measure. This is, and this sounds obvious, but this is something that you do when you are well in order to prevent a worse, you know, you take a small upfront risk in order to avoid a worse, more distant one. Um, and Catherine understood that. She knew she had to convince people to take a risk that they, you know, they thought they might avoid. Humans are, you know, we all have optimism bias. We try and avoid uh, risk and and she needed to convince people that it was it was worth doing that and I think that's exactly what you know what politicians have to do and if we're going to make people take a, a t- even a tiny risk we have to trust them and that's extremely important so that sense that it's interesting it's a kind of strange combination they need to be leading us of course they're they're leading the way they're uh, they're they're showing personally that they're in favor in this case of vaccination but also we kind of need to feel like one at the same time that that they are like us, they are humans like us, therefore the risk affects them as it would affect us. So Catherine, to go back to her again, is kind of, she's ruling as an empress of Russia, she's leading her people and she was very clear about that, but she's also saying, I'm a mother, I'm an ordinary human being, I'm a woman with a woman's body and I took this risk and you can too. I found her, you know, myself being involved in medicine and medical research, I found her boldly going into a, <clears throat> that risk that a lot of people were against it in, within their own country, as you put it, point out in uh, the book. Uh, 
especially religious leaders, which we're starting to see now that some of the religious leaders in our country and yours are against the vaccines, you know, and for whatever reasons they might have. But this is something that we see consistently throughout history with polio. We've seen that there was a lot of polio vaccine deniers. And, you know, as we talked about before, we know people who suffered through polio, the devastation of it, that's long term. So, you know, I, Catherine just became this one leader and yet a common person at the same time as you brought out in the book that she faced both that's, issues at the same time. That's right. And I think she was well aware that in Russia, let's bear in mind, Catherine wasn't Russian. She was a German princess and she was Empress of Russia because uh, through marriage. Um, and she'd actually come to the throne um, through a coup. She'd usurped her own her own husband, Peter III. And so she's ruling as, as Empress. Um, and she was, in terms of smallpox, she was very conscious that uh, the Russian population, particularly the poorer people, but I think it really went across the population, that there was a enormous wariness and superstition um, about inoculation. It was known in Russia, and actually it was practiced in some areas as a kind of folk practice, but it hadn't uh, made its way there in any, any depth um, in terms of kind of official medical practice, if you like, which was going on very much in, in Britain at the time. And the, the big superstition in Russia that she was conscious of, that she wanted to address, was the fear that if you were inoculated, uh, or rather if you were the person who was donating inoculum to inoculate someone else. So just very briefly, inoculation is where um, somebody with smallpox, they have pustules as part of the disease, and, the, uh, and you can take some of the pus from one of those pustules and insert it through a tiny incision into the arm of, uh, of a, a healthy individual that will give them a mild dose of smallpox and then immunity for life. So you're kind of fighting fire with fire. Um, and the belief in Russia was that the person donating the pus would die as a result of that. There was a very strong belief um, about that. And so she not only wanted to show that inoculation in general was safe, but also that this specific superstition was not true. And to do that, she wanted to be the donor of the pus that would inoculate her own son. So she would go first, be inoculated. All this, by the way, was in secret. Um, and then she would, uh, that her English doctor, Thomas Dimsdale, would then from her inoculate her son. Now, in the end, that couldn't happen because irony of irony, ironies, her son managed to get chickenpox at exactly the time when he should have been inoculated when her she was at that stage in the inoculated disease when it would have been appropriate to inoculate him. So they had to find another donor in the end, but she still kind of managed to get, that was a message that she was very clear she wanted to get across. Um, so yeah, and, and you mentioned religious leaders and religious opposition, and she was pretty canny about that as well. She knew she had to get the church on board. And so um, she, after her own inoculation, she ensured that her, her English doctor not only inoculated the nobles of the court in St. Petersburg, who kind of flocked to be inoculated after her because she'd set this fashion. And if the Empress was doing this, then they would too. Um, and of course, she fully understand the, understood the impact of fashion. That's exactly one of the reasons she did it. She was kind of an early influencer, if you like. <laughs> but she made sure that her, her doctor um, inoculated one of the um, kind of bishops uh, in St. Petersburg, if you like, within the Orthodox Church. Um, and Thomas Dimsdale wrote home about this to uh, a relative and, and he spotted that she was doing that to kind of bind the church into this process and make sure that they had to had to back her and, and endorse what she was doing. Yeah, being Russian Orthodox myself, I know quite a bit about the, uh, the power of the church on the people. Uh, you know, luckily, my, my mom was very big into the church and we would have the Metropolitan show up at our house for lunch at times, ah. we knew that their influence on the people was pretty large. I mean, it, without their support, I don't think she would have been very successful in that. But it does lead us to a parallel right now of what you see a parallel between COVID-19, which we've just, you know, we're still in the pandemic, although they say that we're now in the endemic uh, part, 
what the parallel between that and the 18th century smallpox epidemic is. So what do you think about those, you know, similarities between the two? I think it's important to understand that there's dramatic differences, obviously, between the, the two viruses in terms of their kind of lethality, that, uh, and that's in no way to downplay the significance of, of COVID-19. Um, and we're still kind of trying to understand and come to terms with that. And it's obviously cost this planet, you know, multiple hundreds of thousands of lives. Um, however, smallpox was on a, on another scale really but it was i mean in the 18th century the virus was had reached a particularly kind of virulent level um and it's it's difficult to gauge precisely but roughly one in five people it kind of varied in different areas but there's a sort of average of one in five people who contracted it one in five sufferers died from it and of those, it was almost impossible to avoid. Um, and in fact, parents were told at the time, you know, don't count your children until they've had smallpox because it was so likely to carry off infants in particular. Um, and so one in five died. And then of those that survived, they were often left with um, disfigurement or, or blindness um, or other problems with vision so it left a kind of terrible trail in its wake and another kind of sounds maybe superficial but a different a big difference with COVID is its visibility you know this was uh, a disease that had a kind of extraordinary cultural physical presence that people who had suffered from it had scars it was there constantly kind of presenting itself in society I mean obviously that physical presence would would help when it came to um, the WHO eradication campaign. It's a, it's a easier disease to track in that respect. Um, but yeah, highly visible and really terrifying and less a pandemic than a series of epidemic waves that were sweeping, uh, well, in, in Europe uh, in the 18th century, you know, taking a, some 400,000 people uh, 400,000 lives every year so devastating and also absolutely no respecter of rank or of you know any kind of there, there was really nobody that was safe from smallpox which I guess is a is a parallel with with COVID but with smallpox again you know younger children probably most vulnerable but it would it could kill at absolutely any any age at all um, so that's a that's a huge difference one of the really interesting aspects that that resonated with me as I was writing the book was this feeling nevertheless of the kind of uh, the isolation and both sort of human and personal and economic impact of epidemic disease you know of uh, I as I said I was writing this book in in lockdown I mean literally like in in the UK we were supposed to or in England we were supposed to go out for no more than one hour a day you know, and not meet anybody apart from the people we were living with. And I was reading about the experience of people in the um, sort of early part of the 18th century in my own home county where I live now in Essex, you know, and people talking about absolutely never going to London, never even going into the kind of big bigger towns and market towns of Essex when they were struck by smallpox, people would stay at home, the markets would close, the schools would close you know, the economic impact on towns was enormous. And then they would have to try and then convince people once an epidemic had passed that it was safe to return. Um, you know, I've, I've read about people who uh, had kind of not been into London for 20 years because they were so terrified of, of smallpox um, and just hiding out really in the countryside. Um, and so I found, yeah, those connections. And then of course, also that, that common feeling of grief and of loss and of mourning and there are accounts um again from the 18th century particularly of parents who have lost children um you know and the the, the sense of of just you know that the horror of that also resonated with me as we of course were losing people in this country at the same time as well i know uh it was pretty hard my uh, eldest daughter <clears throat> who was has special needs was in the hospital for almost a month. She got out the day before her old roommate passed away from COVID. And just the grief of 
knowing this and, and seeing somebody who's only 50 years old at the time, you know, passing away because of a disease that was just rampant through, you know, our community and, and knowing others who have, you know, suffered from it. And, and I, you know, I had it twice. Thankfully, I was able to recover. I was, you know, healthier, had no, you know, underlying conditions that would make it worse. But with smallpox, there wasn't that. I mean, <clears throat> it wasn't about somebody who was healthy enough to survive. It's whether you were lucky enough to survive smallpox at the time. And, and, and they also didn't know what it was. They didn't really know yeah. what the, this was a virus. That, that, that's, that's absolutely right. I mean, it, it's really important to understand how people kind of conceptual, conceptualize the disease, if you like. Um, so at the beginning of the 18th century, there's no cure for smallpox. There's never been a cure for smallpox. Um, and doctors kind of argued about this and they, but they were fundamentally treating it through sort of different combinations of the same, same things, the same um, therapeutics that they would use for any other fever, really. You know, they might use, they might purge the patient, they might bleed them, they might make them vomit. Um, what they often did was um, wrap them up very warmly because they had a kind of humoral notion of medicine that meant they believed that they needed to kind of sweat out the fever, if you like. Um, Another kind of interesting aspect is they, because smallpox was so universal, they believed that uh, people were born with an, what they called an innate seed, you know, that smallpox was within you, in all of us, because it just, at, and at some point it would come out. So in other words, they didn't understand contagion. And yet at the same time, they did recognize that isolation was important. So they had some understanding of the notion that this could be passed from person to person and yet you know not in a way that at that point early in the century that enabled them to deal with it really so yeah there was there were doctors that even fought there's an interesting example of a, of an, a duel between two doctors in london over whether it was better to make a patient vomit or to purge them <laughs> um and you know but i mean i think that just sums up how basically no one really had any any answer and of course, the kind of crucial thing there is that if you, you know, overheat someone who's already very feverish and suffering from this terrible virus, you are making it far likelier that they'll be even iller and will die. So, in fact, doctors were doing more harm than good a lot of the time. But, you know, the real story there was all they could do was isolate people, treat them and, you know, as in kind of give them nursing care and just hope that they survived um and as i say one in five did not um and there really was not a feeling that an awful lot could be could be done about it the other another interesting point about that actually is how expensive smallpox was um i think the sort of economics of, of healthcare are, are very interesting you know they if you wanted to remove somebody and then care for them that was expensive and my my um the doctor in my book uh, was the son of a, of a surgeon. His father was, in fact, his ancestors before that had been doctors too. Um, and his own father was charging the kind of parish overseers for medical care, looking after smallpox victims. And it was expensive, you know, and the parishes really got cross about having to spend this amount of money. And it's interesting that later, once inoculation actually began to emerge, that this represented a cost saving. So there's actually a kind of economic imperative to protecting people from getting this disease just because it costs so much to treat them and to bury them. So uh, you know, the drivers of uh, drivers of vaccination or inoculation are, are not just, you know, worthy ones, if you like. And we saw that with COVID, you know, the, the expense of treating people and, you know, in the early stages, where would we put all the bodies? that were stacked yeah. up, especially when I looked at New York, my old hometown, what they had to go through in these dense areas. You know, I, I was very lucky. I've been working out of my home since 2008 with my wife. And so when we had to lock down, we were just, okay, well, we're doing the same thing that we've always done. <laughs> but, you know, I, I carry on the board of a trust that investigates infectious disease. And I actually had to argue with somebody that said, well, we don't even know if COVID exists, if there actually is a virus. And I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute, time out. <laughs> We've seen it. We, we have the technology. They did not in the past. You know, when we look at things like the plague, they really didn't know that it was the rats and the, you know, the, yes. these 
that were helping to spread the disease, there was that sense of panic. We didn't know what to do. But really, one of the things that I've found is, and this is very disturbing for me as a historian and in medical research, in the history of uh, scientific discovery, one of the tragedies that I see is that women's roles in these scientific discoveries are extraordinarily downplayed. Uh, we know this with DNA discoveries, uh, the woman who you know, found the helix, she didn't get any Nobel Prize, you know, Crick and Watson did. But can you share some of the examples of the role women played in the history of inoculation? Because I think that's completely unknown to most people. That's right. And yeah, that's a theme that kind of emerges throughout this story. So the story is specifically about, uh, you know, the inoculation of Catherine, but tracking back to the lead up to that, um, there are there are women who are absolute key figures as well. So, I mean, just in terms of where did, how did inoculation come, come to Britain? Um, it came in two ways, really. There were some two reports to the Royal Society, the big scientific society, based in London during the um, first 20 years of the 18th century. But probably more importantly, it was a woman that brought inoculation insight to Britain. And her name was Lady Mary Wortley Montague, it's a fine name. And she was a, a British aristocrat, an extraordinary, um, very, very bright uh, woman, very kind of intellectually active, if you like. And she um, was married to Britain's ambassador to the Ottoman Empire. And she went with him to Constantinople um, in about 1717. And she, Mary had, like many people, had had smallpox herself, had had it badly, was very scarred by it. She'd lost her eyelashes and she had these quite staring eyes as, as a result of that. And she'd also lost her own brother. He died because of smallpox. Um, so she goes to Turkey and while she's there, very soon after arriving, she went to a sort of smallpox party where she witnessed older women inoculating um, children using what she described as a blunt needle and carrying pus in a, a walnut shell. And they would just make a tiny little pinprick in the child's arm, insert a little bit of this um, viral matter, and then uh, the child would go off and play and then they would have this mild dose of smallpox and then be immune. And she was absolutely astounded at this. Bear in mind, she's lost her own brother. She suffered herself. She wrote straight away to a friend in England saying, I'm determined to bring this to Britain. She had her own son inoculated. So again, a mother actually having such faith in this procedure that she will try it on her own child. She got one of these Turkish women uh, to inoculate her son under the supervision of an embassy surgeon in Constantinople. And then when she came back to London at the end of her husband's posting, just shortly after that, she had her daughter, her second child, inoculated in London. But this time um, she had the same embassy surgeon do it and she had it observed by scientists in London. Uh, and then she, her daughter recovered, duly recovered, was fine. And then Mary... <laughs> picked up this daughter, little Mary, and took her around the drawing rooms of elite London saying, look, I've had my child inoculated. She's fine. You should do the same. So another influencer, this is in 1721. And at that time, there was another huge epidemic of smallpox in London. There was some very hot weather at strange times of year. They had roses blooming in January. Uh, so smallpox everywhere. And people followed suit. They, they, we're not talking about the poor. We're talking about the elite Londoners who were influenced by, by Mary and uh, and their children, they did have their children inoculated. Um, and then her next step involves another woman. She, she, as I said, she's an aristocrat, she has a lot of influence and she knew, um, she was well-connected at court and she persuaded uh, Caroline of Ansbach, who was the Princess of Wales. She was the wife of the future George II to have her, two of her daughters, two princesses inoculated. Um, and Caroline, didn't just sort of plunge in. So before before agreeing, agreeing to do this, she had uh, two kind of trials. She commissioned two trials. One was of a group of prisoners um, at a Newgate jail in London. Um, and so this kind of scientific trial of sorts, or certainly observed trial, 
was conducted with these prisoners. They were offered the chance to come forward if they hadn't had smallpox, and and they were told that if you know they survived the inoculation, they could go free. And so they were inoculated, and they all survived. And one of them was actually sent off to test that they were truly immune. There was a kind of miniature challenge trial, if you like, where one of them, a woman, was sent off to a family where the children had smallpox, and she was told to care for these children and to, in fact, sleep in the same bed, which she did, and she didn't get smallpox. So it seemed that she had, she was immune. And then Caroline of Ansbach is still not entirely convinced that this procedure is going to work on children. So she then gets some orphans from uh, from the parish in Westminster. Um, and she had them inoculated as well. And sure enough, they all recovered and they were kind of put on public display for people that wanted to come and see. And, uh, and at that point, she decided that she'd have two of her own daughters inoculated and Julie went ahead with that. And again, they recovered, they were fine. And court dances were, were prepared for them so that they could show that they were healthy and you know had come through this strange new procedure unscathed and so people could come and witness this so it's always about this kind of maternal care this sense that of women who trust this procedure so much that they're willing to actually trust their children's lives to it and then this kind of public showcasing as well to say look this works I did it you can do it too um, so and I, I think this this kind of pattern of women taking care especially elite mothers taking care of their children's health, swapping ideas, sharing experiences, and having these networks of trust where they know that other mothers have taken this plunge, their children are fine, and so they will do the same. And I think, you know, that's not such an outlandish idea. That's very much the way we all kind of do things as parents. You know, we we go to people we know, people who's uh, I don't know who we trust, whose values we believe in, and then we're influenced by them. And that's a very powerful way of spreading uh, these ideas around inoculation because it is it was difficult for parents. They're thinking about their children's lives. They're dealing with an immensely terrifying disease and they need that confidence probably from someone that they, they know closely. And so that's how it began to spread, although it did take a long while for inoculation fully to catch on in, in Britain. It's a pretty amazing story of how women were able to influence that. And then the men would follow suit afterwards. Uh, you know, I see that within medical history, how many times over the generations that that has occurred. And, and also going the other way of women who would say, no, I'm not going to take that risk. I don't want my children vaccinated. And then the suffering that sometimes occurs when they don't take that and, you know, they fall into what we yeah. say some of the social influencers of today saying no we're not going to do this because there is a risk and yes there is a risk uh there are people who will suffer you know there there were people who died after the inoculation but it was so much less and you bring this out in your book so well that the the difference of one in five versus one in a hundred or in two hundred that's a big difference yeah. but that one that dies it does influence other people and it frightens some. So there was a lot of that they had to overcome at the time. And women were at the lead. You're, you're, yeah, you're absolutely right that, that this is, you know, what we're talking about here is, is statistics, isn't it? We're talking about data. And that's what happened in Britain that after Lady Mary Wortley Montague and these two reports from Turkey, um, the, the Royal Society in Britain decided to do a kind of crowdsourcing exercise in which they would uh, ask for experiences of people who were inoculating in Britain, and then they would try and evaluate, you know, okay, what's the mortality rate from natural smallpox versus what's the mortality rate from inoculated smallpox? And they really did just try and do this very basic comparison exercise, but that's extremely important. You know, it's it's really the first time that we're getting this kind of um, data comparison in, in, in medicine and to evaluate a medical procedure. And yeah, early on, Small, according to their calculations, it looked as if inoculation was uh, the mortality rate for inoculated smallpox was about one in 50. And by the way, they were taking information from uh, America as well. It wasn't just um, from Britain. They, they crowdsourced from anywhere that was inoculating because it had kind of developed separately in America. Um, and yeah, about one in 50. Now, the, the survival rates improved dramatically for inoculation, but even then you've got one in five versus one in 50. It's very, very clear where the statistics are leading you. But of course, you know, we know that 
and we've seen this in Britain with with COVID as well, people find, well, you know, the psychology of risk is really complicated and people are really not that great at following statistics. And actually, one of the things I found most interesting in researching this book was that in France, where the medical profession and the church were really very, you know, not not keen on uh, inoculation, to say the least. Um, But it was a procedure that was supported by the philosoph, the kind of intellectuals, people like Voltaire and Diderot. And it almost was a kind of defining feature of being an enlightened person in their terms was that you were a supporter of inoculation and the the um, scientists in France had some really interesting conversations and discussions and wrote interesting papers around this idea of risk and how do you convince people to be reasonable in their terms what would a reasonable parent do and following reason was to kind of follow the numbers if you like but then they you know so they would look at that but then they recognized that people don't just follow the numbers and they kind of started to take that into account as well so they're having discussions that are really remarkably similar than to the ones that we encounter today over why don't people just believe the data well because they think this and that they were they were across all of that in the kind of mid 18th century um I mean it still took them a long time in France really the king had to die of smallpox before inoculation uh, was really accepted. But I, I'd say it's interesting that France kind of had these philosophical discussions, whereas in Britain, people kind of pragmatically got on with it. It was more a case of, well, this works. And that's a very, very 18th century scientific approach, you know, very much empirical observation. This is, we don't really know why this is working, but it's working. And so we'll just keep doing it. Yeah. And uh, we see so many parallels today. Uh, another question is the scientists and thinkers of the inoculation era, and we have to say there's a difference between inoculation and vaccines that uh, Dr. Jenner developed. Uh, really, the inoculation era was the foundation on the current vaccine leaders are standing on. They're standing on those shoulders of those people like Thomas Dimsdale, you know, that, and, and who are those people who were involved in the inoculation, you know, aside from Dimsdale and those why are they so important to us especially today well I, I think what's so interesting is you know we're not necessarily talking about one you know Thomas Dimsdale is important but we're talking about a whole array of people who were all in their different ways kind of pushing forward the boundaries of what they knew and they were also talking to each other this is not just doctors in in Britain they were very much in communication with doctors in France uh, or in Holland or in Geneva. They had many ways of of communicating. And in fact, that's another thing that I found really interesting uh, while I was researching the book, that they were so willing to... um, So doctors like Thomas Dimsdale were actually incredibly well connected. The sort of networks of knowledge were so speedy and also just so so close so that doctors were constantly reading each other's treaties and treatises and building on each other's knowledge it was really quite remarkable it, it had a kind of internet type feel the way that people would just be feeding off each other and very very quickly um you know understanding what was going on in other countries um and so you you really have so so many different people each contributing their own um elements to this Thomas Dimsdale was interesting because he wrote uh, a treatise in 1767 called The Present Method of Inoculating for the Smallpox. And what he was doing was writing down the kind of very latest in inoculation techniques. And what that really meant, to be honest, was that after inoculation had come to Britain from Turkey, um, British doctors and others elsewhere on the continent had overcomplicated it. They'd added all kinds of needless things that actually made it less safe. And then in the 1760s, that largely due to another different doctor called um, Daniel Sutton, uh, also from Britain, all those things were stripped away and Sutton went back to what he called the Suttonian method, a simpler method of inoculating, where he made a tiny incision and he crucially didn't keep the patient really hot after having been inoculated in fact he tried to get them to walk outside in cool air so essentially he's stripping back inoculation to the method that had been used in turkey anyway um and but daniel sutton was an entrepreneur 
kind of biotech entrepreneur of his day. He loved secrecy. He wanted to make money and he did make money. He made more than the prime minister. Um, and he wouldn't explain what he was doing that was making inoculation so safe. Thomas Dimsdale worked that out, wrote it in a treatise. And that treatise then was distributed. It went into some seven or eight editions, uh, was found across Europe and in America, Caribbean. Um, and so Dimsdale's big contribution was to kind of test out this new method and to write it down, to provide almost a manual really that others could use uh, to inoculate for themselves. Um, and that's very important. But other doctors also had their contributions and, and gradually, incrementally, they were moving things forward. And Jenner, uh, Edward Jenner, was himself an inoculator. He was an inoculating doctor. And uh, he was working in, uh, in the town of Berkeley in, in Gloucestershire, in the west of England. Um, and he's obviously known as, as the father of vaccination. But as I'm sure you know, it's slightly more complicated than that. And Jenner is an absolutely landmark figure, but he didn't kind of invent vaccination. He proved that it worked. Now, vaccination emerged. The difference with inoculation and vaccination is vaccination involves inoculating a patient not with smallpox virus, but with cowpox. Now, cowpox is a much milder disease. In humans, it literally lasts two or three days, mild fever, and you're over it, barely any pustules. And he became aware, as did other people, that cowpox was giving people immunity against smallpox. So you're getting, you can inoculate with a much safer, very uh, non, very much non-fatal disease to protect against uh, a fatal one. And that's extremely important. He had, I'm going to say that again, it's just too complicated to explain that badly. Let me just explain it again. Sorry. Okay. So Edward Jenner, crucially, is, was himself an inoculator. And we should understand here the difference between inoculation and vaccination. So Inoculation, as I've explained, meant fighting fire with fire. It was giving a patient a small dose of smallpox itself in order, in order to give them a very mild case of the disease and then immunity for life. But what Jenna did was prove that you could also inoculate with cowpox, a much, much milder disease, not fatal. It really just gave humans a, a, a fever for a couple of days, but that that uh, disease, cowpox would also give immunity against smallpox. So far less risk. Uh, and that's, that's his huge contribution was proving that that worked. People, doctors had begun to realize that that was the case. And they partly realized it because they were inoculating against smallpox in dairy areas of Britain. And they were finding that mysteriously people, when they inoculated them, already seemed to be immune to smallpox. They weren't having the expected reaction. And yet they said they hadn't had smallpox and they couldn't really understand how that could be. And they began to realize it was because these people had had cowpox and that had given them immunity to smallpox. Um, um, and, and so it eventually and Jenna led, was able to prove that. And eventually led to the eradication of smallpox. A lot of younger listeners here don't remember smallpox vaccinations and they don't remember that you know, this was a you know disease that devastated populations. Uh, now we're seeing an outbreak of monkeypox, which is, and they're starting to say, well, we might need to bring back the old smallpox vaccinations for people. And what's interesting is that even if you have a disease and you get vaccinated, it can stop the progression. Monkeypox, thankfully, monkeypox is not as virulent as smallpox. And we're also seeing this with polio and how we're trying to eradicate it. As a Rotarian, we've been involved since the 80s, I think around 1985 when we started the movement with the World Health Organization and others like the Gates Foundation to try to eradicate that disease. And you know we're very close, unfortunately COVID hit and a lot of people weren't getting those vaccinations and we're starting to see it bubble up again. We're hoping that we can contain it. You know, it's been eradicated in, in most continents aside from you know, areas of Pakistan and Afghanistan still. But we're, you know, the, the vaccination is working for this because these are devastating diseases, but they are somewhat unlike COVID. COVID is a mutating virus that mutates very easily, whereas things like smallpox and polio do not. 
you know, we have others like Ebola and SARS, you know, that we see that they can mutate around vaccination. So we're still trying to learn all of this and understand it. And I was involved in a paper that's being written, right? You know, it's coming out shortly about how the virus, this one COVID is actually mutating around the vaccinations. And so we have to start working at trying to keep our health up because this is, you know, another ongoing issue. And, and one of the things that I've worked on and, and been writing, and the Russian flu that supposedly happened in the 19th century was very likely to be a coronavirus and not just the standard flu. And it affected one Russian ruler, which was Alexander III. He contracted that Russian flu and four years later died of kidney nephritis. A very healthy, robust man was 49 years old, was considered extremely healthy, and yet he suffered the consequences in probably long COVID, you might say, you know, in today's parlance. But that was something that a number of people at the time had to go through. And there's a lot of parallels between the two. The Russian flu circumnavigated the world in just a few months. Within six months, it was already in San Francisco. There were no airplanes, no cars, and it affected Older people who would die from it, the very same group that were dying now, as opposed to, say, the Spanish flu, which is misnamed, uh, that was affecting younger people. So we have two episodes of this coronavirus going around and how it just, you know, ravaged countries. And we're seeing the same thing now. So, but for a completely that's, that's different, fascinating. You know, completely different uh, yeah. topic, uh, there's a TV series that's on Hulu here in, in the States. It's called The Great, and the whole, uh, the original name of it is The Great, an occasionally true story. It's about Catherine the Great. And what still amazes me is that Peter's still alive. <laughs> yeah. <this> time. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it really presents a very new view of Catherine. Uh, do you think there's any accuracy and does it shed any new light on this truly remarkable person? Yeah, I watched it actually. We've had access to it here as well. And in fact, um, I think it's the last episode of the first series does feature her smallpox inoculation, her decision to have herself inoculated against smallpox. Um, I watched this with some trepidation, as you say, an occasionally <laughs> true story. Um, but, you know, actually, I am quite beguiled by it. I agree with you that it does, um, part of me kind of shudders at this kind of hang on and it waits, she's on the throne with this guy who actually she usurped. And by the way, he died um, about six days after she, uh, or he was murdered, in fact, six days after she uh, took the throne from him. Um, but once you get past that, what I found fascinating is that the show does show her as someone who is incredibly interested in political philosophy, as someone who comes to Russia from abroad and comes there with um, on a mission to kind of change it, to open it up to the West, uh, to bring new ideas. She's constantly kind of battling with people that don't want that to happen. Um, you know, and I think it captured somehow some of that that spirit, her her optimism, her desire to change, her incredible interest in ideas, which are some of the things that are just the most fascinating about her when you uh, when you look into her life. And I mean, this inoculation is an absolutely prime example of that. That's one of the reasons why I was so keen to to write about it because to me it it sums up a lot about her, her her curiosity, her openness to ideas, her extraordinary kind of political acumen and understanding of statecraft how do you go about convincing people of something that they don't not only don't want to do but really are terrified of um you know and also kind of how do you turn a personal action you know protecting yourself from disease the ultimate personal action and then your child and make it into a political statement that's you know she she knew how to go from the personal to political um and i if you think about also just the use of the female body, what do female rulers do? What can they do with their body? They don't go and fight in battles. You know, they can bear children. They can have heirs. Well, guess what? She's done something else, something really remarkable. She's used her body as the kind of site of a scientific experiment. She is her own scientific trial. And then she goes and publicizes that. And that is just, 
utterly remarkable, I think. And it, especially given the kind of smears to her reputation and the ways that history has chosen to describe her or, or kind of reduce her as a, as a female ruler to, you know, just stories about her love life or worse. I am determined that this story about her body should be the one that people know instead. I think that's that's just truly remarkable because that's one of the things that while researching her, you have to get around her son who despised her, Paul, just writing all these terrible things about her and having people, you know, uh, diminish what she did. And and I think that his actions after that, because of that, is what caused the eventual you know, downfall of the Romanovs, not allowing a woman to ever become the czar or czarina, you know, empress, and just going down that one pathway that just got weaker and weaker czars until, you know, the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917 and, and how that affected. Uh, and also with that, that show on Hulu, I was, like you, very trepidatious and had real problems. And my, my family doesn't <laughs> sit around when I'm watching it because I'm going, that's just not the way it happened. You can't do that. <laughs> so they'll be in another room going, oh, yeah. dad's just uh, upset at <laughs> what's going on but it yeah. does show her as being a very vibrant person which i think yeah. a lot of people don't understand how incredible it was that here's this woman from germany who would lead the russian people but she embraced russia she really wanted to make the changes that she saw that peter had done peter the great and she wanted to just you know bring it to another level and it, your book uh, the Empress and the English Doctor, phenomenal read. It's coming out in June. Uh, I just think all my listeners should pick up a copy of it. It was a lot of fun. And the stories about the people, that's what was really remarkable about it, about Dimsdale, about Sutton, about Catherine, and all the people that were involved in it. It was just truly remarkable to see that these were, you brought out how human they were, that they weren't just, you know, famous figures from the past that there were human beings who had real fears you know especially Dimsdale going in what if Catherine had died they had an escape policy you know how to get him out of the country in case something should happen to That's him right. because he would have been dead in a moment you know and, and how that would have changed things and, and you brought that fear out and you know but also his belief that he was going to help change the world and save people and how selfless he was but he did, you know, get quite enriched by this, you know, journey to Russia, which was not easy. I mean, you know, he didn't get on a plane and fly over to St. Petersburg. This was a heck of a journey for him. He, to get from, he know, did, yeah. England over to no, St. Petersburg. No, that's right. So, yeah. That's it, right. I mean, he, yeah. It was a fabulous 1,700-mile journey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And in that time, 1,700 miles was, you know, not an easy trip to take so well, anyways i want to thank you lucy for your amazing interview and again everybody read the empress and the english doctor it's a fabulous story i'm really looking forward to having people respond to me and tell me how they loved it you know because it, it is a great story so until next time uh, our next episode is going to be on the men surrounding peter the great uh people like patrick gordon and others who really influenced Peter and partied pretty hearty with the man as he went on his you know, <laughs> great embassy and all that type of stuff. They were fascinating people. So till next time, Dasvidaniya, Dasiva Bolshoyev.